Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam Nasser, and this is the Cleveland C Sharp VB.net user group. Uh, a little bit about the group. We meet every month. Uh, meetings are free of charge and open to the public, and we cover any and all topics related to .NET. Uh, you can find meeting information on uh, meetup.com at the URL listed below. I'd like to give a big thank you to our sponsors, uh, Tech System and uh, iNeedo for sponsoring the pizza and the drinks, which we have when we meet in person. And hopefully we'll be doing that again uh, in the near future. Uh, for tonight's prize drawings, we have PostSharp and DevExpress that have donated uh, some licenses. And those will be raffled off using the, the eval form that will be posted in chat uh, shortly afterwards. I'd uh, also like to give a big, big thank you to NIS Technologies for sponsoring the web hosting. We have a special offer from Manning.com. Uh, if you utilize the discount code MTPCLEC21 exclamation, uh, you can get 35% off on a selection of books. And uh, that is available at the URL uh, listed there. And that will also be made available uh, afterwards in the chat window. Some general information. Please keep in mind, participation is highly encouraged. There is no such thing as a stupid question unless it's the one not being asked. Uh, feel free to jump in at any point in time with comments or questions. Uh, however, when not speaking, kindly ask you to mute your mics to prevent any background noise. Also, like to keep it casual but organized in the sense that we want to give enough time for our presenter to go through the slides and the demos. Uh, but at the same time, like I said, don't hesitate to jump in with a question. And tonight's presentation will be recorded and posted on YouTube uh, with a link made available later. So for tonight's feature presentation, if you've been working in .NET, you probably know tonight's presenter, and that is Carl Franklin. He's gonna be talking about minimal APIs in .NET 6. Carl is the co-host of .NET Rocks, a great podcast that's been running for how many years now, Carl? 10? Uh, since, no, 20, since 2002. 20 wow, since long time. Two or three years before the word podcast existed. <laughs> Way to go. Thank you. And he's also the host of blazertrain.com and he's the executive vice president of App V Next. And so without further ado, I will turn it over to Carl. Thank you very much. Tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, minimal APIs in .NET 6. And so uh, I'm going to just jump right in to the code and start explaining things. We're going to start with an ASP.NET Core empty project. That means there's nothing in it. Well, there is one little thing, and that's a minimal API. So let's check it out. It's going to be called min API. And uh, this is actually something that I did on a show that I do called Blazor Train. And if you go to blazertrain.com, this is uh, something I started in, when was it, 2020 or 2019? Let's see. Oh uh, yeah, 2020, and uh, this is um, you know just as Blazor was coming out, and there's a whole bunch of topics here as you can see, just tons of them. And one of the recent ones that I did was minimal APIs in .NET 6. So yes, this is being recorded, but if you want to see the original, it's right there, and also the code that I'm going to show is right there as well. Um, but you know what? I have updated the code since, so maybe I'll give uh, the code to you guys and you can distribute it. How's that? So if you haven't seen an ASP.NET 6 uh, application, check this out. There's no startup CS anymore. There's just program CS. And this is for every web application in .NET 6. And all the stuff that was in uh, startup is now in program. So you have a builder, and you can add your services here, builder services, whatever. And then you have your app that comes from builder.build, and now you can do your pipeline stuff down here like you normally do. But look at this. App get. What they've essentially done is created an API controller, the default API controller. That's, that's the route. 
no parameters, and it just returns a string, hello world. That is an API controller in one line of code. Isn't that cool? And if you just run this thing, as is, this is a VM, so it's not my speedy, speedy machine. So it's going to take a minute the first time. So hello world. Boy, howdy. Isn't that awesome? I'm a genius. Uh, let's see what else we can do. So here is a map get where it's still the default controller, but we're taking a parameter name. Okay, and now the there's one argument, name, string, and we're returning hello, name, exclamation mark. So same app, same code. The default controller wins. Hello world. But if I pass a name, if I do slash name, like slash Carl, hello Carl, slash Sam, Hello, Sam. You get the idea. Uh, so what about services? As I said before, you can add services here, singletons, whatever you like, just like you could before. Uh, and we can even have a service that we can call from a controller with very little code. And this Minimal API is part of a, an effort at Microsoft that you're really seeing coming into its own with C-sharp 10 and C-sharp 9 before that, where they're trying to get rid of cruft. You know, they're trying to get rid of ceremony. And so, you know, when you have a, a console application, it looks just like this. You just have a program. You have whatever you want to do right there. We'll, we'll see some other stuff like that in a minute. But first, let's add a service. Let's add one called, oh, I don't know, hello service. Hello service. And it's going to be a very simple service. It's just going to have one method, say hello, pass the name, and it's going to return hello name. I'm trying to keep it simple here. Okay, now I need to do a few things differently in program. So rather than one line here, one line there, I'm just replacing the whole thing. So here we go. We're saying builder.services, add singleton of hello service, right? And creating a new one of those. So this is the same. That's the same. Now we have this map get hello. And the arguments are the HTTP context, which we always get with the service, and the service itself, hello service. And we're returning hello service dot say hello. And the name we're getting from the context query string, context request query name is whatever the name that's passed on the query. And so we're going to do something like this slash hello question mark name equals Carl to get into this service. It gets better. We have to start slow. All right, so let's do, oh boy, that didn't work. Uh, hello question mark name equals Carl. Hello, Carl. So that got into the service. And we could even set a breakpoint in there. And do like, hello, Sam. Boink, there it is. There's my name, Sam. So that's what we mean when we say minimal APIs. Now, this is really, really rudimentary, right? We're, we're mapping gets, and gets are all fine and good, but what about posts, right? Well, let's, let's, let's create an object because, you know, you don't post 
strings usually. Sometimes you do, but in the real world, we deal with classes and objects. So let's create a class. And I'm actually going to go one step beyond that and make a record. So I'm going to call it customer. So a record is, is a class if it doesn't have a struct keyword then it's a class it's a value type and you can use record anywhere you can use um, a class you get this sort of very verbose creating uh, syntax where you're defining the record um, and these are essentially initialize only properties so when you create the customer you pass the name and the email and then they can't be changed now you can do getters and setters with records just like you can with classes. But out of the box, you get this feature of immutability, which is kind of cool. So from here, let's do a map get customer. Right? So now if we pass customer, we're going to return a new customer and this is how I create it, just passing the name and the email address. And by the way, I did uh, another show. I do another show called the .NET Show, .NET show.com. I recently did um, this guy right here, uh, classes, records, and structs, oh my. So I really dive into the difference between these types, what you should know about them. Um, I, I revisit fundamental concepts like the stack and the heap and I um, went I, I showed this to um, Mads Torgerson and he thought it was awesome so I got the thumbs up from Mads who worked on these features in C sharp and uh, that that made me happy so it's been sanitized for your protection all right so mapping a get just like that Now, if I run this, and I say slash customer, there it is, in JSON glory. Name is Adora Jar, email is adorajar.com. All right, now what about post? Yes, you can map post. And here, rather than just having a, a default return value, I've actually got some squirrely braces, curly braces. And uh, I'm going to put a breakpoint here so we can see, you know, your customer's name is the customer name and the email address. We create a string right there just to, just to show that, you know, you got control right here. Somebody does a post. This is your handler. This is your code. Now, in order to test this, I want to add a console app to my solution. And it's going to be called min API test. And by the way, um, Sam said it, but if anybody has any questions at any time, feel free to interrupt me. I'm not going to take it personally. I'm a teacher. That's what I do. Okay. So we're creating this uh, console application. And we're going to ask the user to press enter to send a post request. Wait for that. And then using an HTTP client, we've got a URL. We're going to create a new customer and post it as JSON. Problem number one, we don't know what a customer is. So a little bit later, I'm going to break out and create a shared project that has models in it and stuff. But for now, I'm going to take the lazy way out and just add a reference, a project reference to my min API project where the customer is defined. That's problem number one. Issue number two is this magic number right here. What's the port? So if I go to my uh, web API or, you know, my minimum API uh, 
web application. Typically, we use IIS settings in Visual Studio, but in .NET 6 and Visual Studio 2022, uh, we're using Kestrel by default. So you can see min API up here instead of IIS Express. And so there's the number right there, 725. Now I'm going to leave that open because I'm probably going to refer to that for some other code. All right, now the third thing I need to do is make sure both of these projects run at the same time. So I'm going to go into the solution properties into startup projects. I need to change both of these to start for both project types. Now when I press the button, the start button, they'll both run. All right, where am I? That's this guy. Here we go. Now remember we have our breakpoint in here, right? Right there. Wrong one. What's going on? Where'd it go? There you are. Here it is. Now there's the breakpoint, and I know you can't see that, but if I try to zoom in, it's going to go dark on me. Your customer's name is Carl Franklin, and email address is carl at appfenex.com. I don't know if you can see that. It's... Right, just to show that you can handle posts with JSON very, very minimally. Okay, so we're going to remove the console app. Just remove that. Don't need that anymore. And um, I'm going to add, let's talk about Blazor. So we're going to add a Blazor app, a Blazor server application. And this will be called min api demo and i also want to add to the solution a library where that customer record can go let's start getting real here and this will be called min api dot shared And get rid of class one CS. Visual Studio thinks it's doing us a favor by giving us class one when in fact they're not. Okay, so let's look at uh, min API demo. We have to add a reference to the shared project from both min api and min api demo before we do that let's move the customer record into the shared project and this is one of the reasons that i love not using namespaces anymore i mean i still use them when i'm when i've got something complex but for simple demos and stuff and simple apps they just get in the way and besides now you can use global namespaces so even if I have namespaces, I never have to look at them. All right, so customer is in there from min API demo, which is Blazor. We're going to add a project reference to min API shared. And from my web server, my API server, we're going to add a project reference to min API shared. So now they both have access to that customer. So let's hijack index razor in the Blazor application and do this. Now, of course, we have to change our startup projects 
in the solution so that the API starts. Now we don't have a console app, but we have this Blazor application. So both of those have to run. And they will both load the min API shared library. So here we go. We've got uh, on our on initialized async, we're using a new HTTP client. We have to get the magic number, of course. We get that from launch settings JSON. Copy that. All right. So here's customer. And we're calling await HTTP, get from JSON async, the customer, the URL. So this is the same thing that we were doing before in a console app. But now we have a nullable customer. And by the way, if nullables still confuse you, go to the .NET show and watch It's a Nullable World, where that's the uh, most recent one, where I talk about all of this stuff. Because uh, nullable reference types, which is kind of a misnomer, they should be nullable, null aware reference types. Um, those are the new normal. You know, it's enabled by default everywhere in .NET 6 applications, and sometimes people get a little confused by it. Uh, so that's it. So if the customer is not equal null, we're just showing who that customer is, name and email address in the Blazor app. There you go. Customer name is Isidore Jar. Email isidorejar.com. All right. Questions so far? Hey, Carl. Um, you may have mentioned this already, but did you need to do any JSON serialization when you're getting those properties of name and email address? No. Is that something new with the minimal APIs? or? Uh, no, not really. I'm, okay. I'm using get from JSON async. Oh, so, okay. yeah, with that, it's built in HTTP client, and uh, it does all the serialization for me. I just tell it what you to gave, expect. You gave it the type. I see. It yep, makes sense. Yep. All right. So uh, next, next, next. Yes. Let's go to program. And we have a map get for multiple customers. Uh, right. Hang on a second. Uh, move customer. I did all this. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Map get customers. This is my to-do list over here. So whereas we still have customer for post and get, now we have customers plural. And if we get that, we're returning a list of customers, which is kind of cool. So let's change our index razor handle that. Still pretty simple. We have a new list of customer here. And uh, on initialized, we go and hit this guy here at the right port. Customers, plural. And if the list comes back not null, we're adding the range to our existing customers. And if customers count is greater than zero, we're just going to show them in an unordered list. There we go. Now in the real world, we don't have customer records like this with no IDs or anything. If you're gonna do any CRUD stuff, you really have to have primary keys and uh, in your DTOs or in your, in your classes, in your models. So I'm gonna change customer to a class and now we've got our primary key int and we have our name and email properties. Now I have to change the, the handlers here instead of using a record. Uh, we're gonna do things a little bit differently. 
So here I still have my hello service at the top, but now I've got a new list of customer and we're adding three customers to it. Now these are classes again, so with IDs one, two, and three. Still have this demo and this demo, and we're still getting a single customer, but now we're returning customers first. And if we do a map get for all customers, we were just returning customers, the whole list. And if we do a post, we're adding customer to our customers list. So it's all in memory right now, but still, you can see we, we've got uh, three endpoints here that use this customer with just a few lines of code. Okay, back to index, make some changes there. Now on initialized async, I'm calling get customers. And the reason I moved all this code out is because I need to call it a couple of times. Once when we uh, get all the customers at the beginning and then after we add a customer because we're going to be able to create a new customer here. I also have uh, a base URL set up. Now in the real world, I'd put this in config, but I just want to keep everything above board, not hide anything. And that's why I did that for the demo. So now we've got a new list of customer and I've got a single customer and that we're going to bind to this, to these inputs here um, for new customer name and email. And when we click send new customer, now we're going to uh, set the customer ID to get next ID. And this is some simple, don't do this in the real world code, where because I don't have a database that's going to give me an identity value back when I create a customer, I'm just looking in the customers and getting the maximum ID, you know, the highest ID, adding one to it, and that's my ID. And so this particular customer is bound here. So that takes care of the name and email. I set the ID, I post it. And then I call get customers again. Okay. So up here, the markup is pretty simple again. We just have an unordered list for all the customers. But now we have these, this uh, UI to create a new customer. There we go, here's our three customers. And I'll uh, myself here. And there I am. I could do a few more and a few more, no problem. So this would be ID one, two, three, four, five, six, but I'm not really sure about that. In the next demo, I'm actually gonna show the ID to see if that thing worked. So, and what is that next demo? Well, it's going to be a map delete. So, let's go down here and add map delete. So, this is going to take an ID as a parameter. Now, it's not a parameter on the URL. It could be, but I decided to do it in uh, the query string. <coughs> so up uh, deletes, I want to look for the customer in customers where the ID matches, and if it's not null, I just remove it. It's pretty simple there. Get back into index. Change that up, and I've created now a delete customer method. And I've got my, all of that stuff right there. My base URL customer with a question mark ID equals customer dot ID. And now I'm calling HTTP delete async and then get customers to refresh the list.
Now, the only thing I've done in the UI, I've added this button right here to delete the customer. And this passes the customer that comes through the iteration to my delete customer method. And also, that's right, I told you I was going to put the customer ID in there. And I did that as well. Because the thing is, once you start deleting records and IDs get calculated, they get all screwy. And in the real world, what you want to do is make sure you never repeat an ID if this is a real identity. And I deleted two, uh, or I deleted three, and I added one. I don't want it to be three. I want it to be four. But I'm not doing that for the demo. I just want to make sure that it works. So I'll delete Mike, the middle guy, by myself again. That should be four, and it is. All right, so delete works, add works, get works. So of all of the crud, create, retrieve, update, delete, update is the next one. So let's do a map put. So here's my map put, passing the customer, and uh, I'm pulling the customer out where the ID matches. And if it's not null, I don't want to. I don't. I want to actually replace the customer in the list. I don't want to have to go and uh, you know set the values each value of each property. I just want to replace the customer in the list. So I'm getting the index of the current customer that is matching the ID. And then I'm setting that reference to this reference customer. Go to index. So here's my update customer that I added. It's just base URL customer, but now I'm doing a put as JSON async. Now I also have current customer. What's that? Well, let's take a look up here. In my customers, uh, I've got now an edit customer and a delete customer. And I have this current customer. If it's not null, then I'm showing the name and the email address so that I, I have UI to update it. So where does current customer get set? right here in edit customer. So if I'm going to edit, all I'm doing is setting current customer to this customer and in, in invoking state has changed. And that's going to cause this UI to display. And then uh, I'm binding to the name and email address here when I press update. Then I'm calling put and get customers again. Number, which did we go? All right, so we can delete Mike. Let's edit Isadora. Isadora Jarhead. Updated. New customer. Ever. So there you go. Complete CRUD with an in memory database and not a whole lot of code, and it's all in program. All right. Didn't have to have a controllers folder, didn't have to have a controller, don't have to decorate these with HTTP GET, HTTP POST, all of that stuff. We're just mapping a route, passing parameters. We have code. But as you know, that is not, uh, you know, this is a Blazor server application, uh, a Blazor WebAssembly application. It's a little bit different. And I'm not going to go into everything about Blazor WebAssembly, but I am going to show you one thing that's really cool. So let's close this. We'll come back to this. 
And I'm going to create a new project. And this is going to be a Blazor Web Assembly app. And I'll call this Wasm Min API Demo. I want to make it a hosted, an ASP.NET Core hosted project. Right? We're talking about APIs here. So the easiest way to do this with a WebAssembly application is make it hosted. And then you can write your APIs on the server side. Any questions? Okay, so if you look in the server project, the program, right? This is all stuff you've seen before. But what's cool is I can, I have my app and I can just take those same, you know, map methods, map get, map put, map post, and just add them right down here to program in the server. Now, if I have uh, an index page, I could call that with. Now, what's cool is that in a Blazor uh, WASM project, and we're in the WASM project itself, the HTTP client is already configured with the base address of the server. Right? So all I really have to do is inject it. I don't need to have magic numbers with ports or anything like that. So I'm injecting that HTTP client, and that's what I'm using to get string async uh, and pass my name. So this is going to be the uh, say hello because, remember on the server we have this, we just pass the name. And we're getting back hello name. So I'm, I have my name right here, which I've bound to this input. And I have a message, which I'm showing here. Pretty simple. Very simple. Yeah, go ahead. Got it. So I'm going to enter my name. Santa Claus. Say hello. Hello, Santa Claus. All right. That is the easiest API layer I've ever written using uh, C Sharp, using .NET, and certainly using Blazor. But that's all I'm going to say about um, uh, WASM. Uh, it's really the same. Your server is here, and you can add your maps in there and call them using the HTTP client that you inject. All right, I want to get back to my other project now. Because this is all fine for an in-memory database, but let's actually use a real database. And uh, I've got a database here in my SQL Explorer in LocalDB. It's the Chinook database, and this is a sample database you can get online. Uh, if you just go search for Chinook sample database, right here on GitHub, and you can go dig down into the database, and you've got uh, data sources and all sorts of different database types. If you go to SQL Server, you can 
view it raw or download it, and you've got a script to create, whoops, to create the database and not only create it, but populate it with data. So that's exactly what I did. Here's my Chinook database. And we're going to be using this employee table. Oops. Right there. Okay. Pretty simple stuff. And to do this, um, we're going to be using Dapper. Now I have another repository out here. If you go to my GitHub, uh, let's just go there, github.com slash Carl Franklin slash Dapper demo. This is a repository where um, I show you how to use Dapper with the repository pattern and link in a Blazor server application. So Dapper is a, uh, and yeah, and there's the link to Chinook, and I also use Northwind and another database. But um, Dapper is a very lightweight um, at, way that you can access SQL Server uh, through simple SQL commands without having to do all the cruft of ADO.NET. It's as fast as ADO.NET because it is ADO.NET. I believe it's ADO.NET under the hood. And so that you don't have to create, you know, connections and parameters and all that stuff. You can just create SQL queries and execute them. And, and it's very simple and very fast. So a lot of people like it, especially on the web. Um, so what I need to do is add some projects here that uh, I used in Dapper Demo. I'm not going to go through the whole demo, but I am going to pull in the code for it. So here you go. We are using Dapper. We're also using this Dapper Contrib, which does some really cool things for Link. Uh, and I'll show you what those are. Uh, that would be insert, delete, updates, and uh, you know your CRUD applications. Add, it adds those to Dapper. So that's cool. Uh, next, we're going to use an iRepository interface. And if you haven't used the repository pattern, you don't know what you're missing. This is a way to abstract away um, the inner workings of you know the the what's going to be your repository is it going to be a database is it going to be in memory and you can write your code starting with a, a memory repository um, and then you know graduate to uh, a database at a different time using the same interface so here's our repository And this goes through different iterations with me. Um, it started out a little bit more opinionated and now is, uh, I think, has matured a bit. So we've got uh, get all, and you can see that it's using generics, right? I repository of T entity. So T entity, in this case, might be customer or employee. And the only requirement that I have, the only constraint is that it's a class. So get all async returns all of the items. Get async passes a query. But I also have this other get async. In the case where your uh, repository underneath can use link to filter and order by and include properties, um, this is very, very handy. It works well with Entity Framework, um, but not so well with Dapper. So that's why I added this guy right here, just a query. So you could say, you know, select star from employees where ID equals blah, 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 whatever. Uh, then we have an insert. 
an update and a delete. Pretty simple. Now we're going to add a Dapper repository, which is an implementation of this built on Dapper. Now it's complaining um, because I haven't added these namespaces yet. Oh, I know why, because that hasn't saved namespaces there, but I didn't save the project that had the references. Okay, it should be happy now in a second. One, two, there you go. So here's my Dapper repository of T entity, which means I can reuse this for any type of entity using Dapper. And again, we have the same constraint. T entity is a class and it implements I repository of T entity. And I've got a SQL connection string, a primary key type, primary key name. These are all things that I need inside in order to access Dapper and to uh, handle the key in the situation where the key is. What is it? Um, is it an int32? Is it a string? If it's an int32, is it an identity? In other words, will the database set the ID value when it returns after an insert, or do I have to provide it? Those things I need to know if I'm going to handle things well. So before I talk about explicit key, let's add the model here, um, employee. And I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but The model we're going to be working with for Chinook is called employee. So these things, uh, it's complaining about them because we don't have Dapper Contrib in this project yet. So I need to add that here. And now employee, in a second or so, these things will kick in. All right. So this is from Dapper Contrib. Obviously, it tells Dapper Contrib what table, the table name, because it could be different than the class name. Right. And this explicit key means that employee ID is an int, but it is not an identity. And you can see that here. If you look at employee ID int not null, then you go look at is identity, and it's false. It's the way the database is right off the internet. I mean, I didn't create this, so we have to handle that situation. So this explicit key says this has to be specified. It can't be zero, right, or null if it was nullable. If it if it is a primary, uh, if it is an identity, we could just use key, but it's not. All right, so needless to say, Dapper repository deals with all of these things. It has the get and uh, with the query. It has the get async with all of these things, and I'm using a not implemented exception because it doesn't work with Dapper. And then get all insert this is the one that has to figure out what the identity is and blah 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 and uh, now i'm going to use for uh if it's a string i'm going to use this thing called dapper sql helper which i'll add now and i wrote this little tool as well and that creates an insert string Dapper SQL Helper, there it is. So this will get an insert statement giving the entity and the table name. Does a little reflection, pulls out the properties, all of that. It's not perfect, but it works. Okay, now we need to access the data with a connection string. And that is right here. Chinook connection string. It's just my local DB. 
We did that. We did that. Okay, now we have to go back to program services. We're going to add the dapper stuff right here. So we're adding a singleton, dapper repository of employee. And look at this. The builder now has the configuration built right into it. You don't have to inject that like you did used to had to do in the startup. It's right there. Builder configuration get connection string. Evolution of the language. It just keeps getting better. Finally, I just need to add my Chinook endpoints down here. So here you go. Employees, if I want all employees, uh, and this is an async call. I'm returning await employee manager, which I just created up here, right? That's what employee manager is, the Dapper repository. Uh, and so a DAP repository of employee, employee manager gets passed in. I await employee manager, get all async and return it. If I'm posting two employees, I have my DAP repository, I have my employee. That argument goes first. And I insert async employee. And here we've got map delete. And here I've got an employee ID, which is my argument. So that goes first. And then this gets injected, employee manager, calling get all async, and I'm returning. You know, it's a little bit of a cheese, but it works. And then I'm deleting if the employee is null. And then put, it's the same idea. We're retrieving and changing the value calling update async hey carl i got a quick question yes so uh, up on your map delete um right up above this how does the minimal api know what's supposed to be a parameter and what's supposed to be injected yeah it's again, convention um you put all your parameters first and then you inject any services that you've created up here like the so hello it, service it or doesn't service. find it in the service provider it's going to assume it's a yes parameter. but the order is important as far as i know anyway what i read is <laughs> you have to put your parameters first and when you're done with your list then you add the uh injected items okay cool yeah Thanks. all right so for this demo we're going to overtake fetch data because why not there and we can use it now of course this has got to change up here let's get that again magic number okay let's let's well yeah let's start down at the bottom i always like to start at the bottom so Uninitialized async, I'm loading all employees. Uh, I'm getting that from uh, the HTTP client, get from JSON async, a list of employees. And if the result is not null, I'm clearing my employees uh, list and adding that range. And again, the reason why I did this is because I need to reuse this uh, and call it multiple times. So I can't assume that it's clear. Um, that list of employees is right there. I initialized it to a new list. I have employee selected employee, and I'm just going to let .NET 6 yell at me. I know what I'm doing, and so that's fine. I could make it nullable, which would help me deal with nulls, but I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, okay, let's go up here now. If the employee's count is greater than zero, we have a select, which is like a list box. And anytime we click, we're calling this whatever on change is set to employee selected. Anytime we click on an employee, 
And because it's async and I don't have any awaits, I just have this in here to appease the compiler. Um, so I'm pulling out the value that's passed in, args.value to string, converting that to an int, and that is the ID of the employee that was selected. Now that value comes from right here. If uh, it, it's the value here, so uh, value is employee, employee ID. The reason that I have this condition here is because if this employee is the one that's selected, then I use this selected attribute. Otherwise, I don't. Okay. So down here in employee selected, I, I'm creating my selected employees. Right? I'm just pulling it out of the list first or default. Then... If selected employee is not null, I'm showing the address, and I have two buttons, one to delete it and one to update it. Now, there isn't any UI to update. When I call update employee, the only thing I'm doing to exercise that is taking the address of the employee and setting it to a string that says updated at you know date time now. So that's the demo of updating into the database. Add employee, uh, I'm basically creating, you know, Carl Franklin with the same data every time I call add employee. Just to exercise it, here's post as JSON async. But I, I need to know if I can add an employee, and that's why I have this property here. Can I add Carl? Uh, it's a read-only property, and I'm pulling out you know this record from employees with the first name and last name match and uh, if it's null then I can add Carl if not I can't and so if can I add Carl I have a button to add Carl and I think that's I think that's it so let's give it a shot All right, there's the same demo we left off last time. Now if we go to fetch data, here are employees. I can add Carl because Carl's not in there. Let's try updating Gene Peacock. Updated. Now just to show you that this is indeed writing to the database, let's close it. Uh, you open it again go to fetch data and gene peacock and it should be updated and it is now i can add carl and my add carl goes away there i am i can delete deleted uh, let's try to delete Jean. Yeah, can't delete Jean, uh, Jane rather, because Jane has records that uh, are uh, related, related records. So, guys, that is pretty much it for my presentation. We covered a lot of stuff, but the long and short of it is. This minimal API uh, syntax is really, really nice. Now, okay, so I can see where this is going to be very helpful for some applications. But, I mean, I have applications that I work on that have 10, 12, 100 controllers. And that could get pretty hairy down here. So unless you're doing things like partial classes and regions and things, it could it could get hairy. Uh, but I think for you know a lot of 
certainly uh, small applications where you only have a few controllers and you need some CRUD application, uh, some CRUD endpoints. This, it's very, very nice. And in general, I like the way that uh, the C Sharp team is going with removing cruft. Even have things like global usings. Like I can say uh, global using system dot whatever. Yeah, buffers. Um, and by default, if you look, these implicit usings are enabled. And that's why you don't see them anywhere, like system, system IO, system uh, collections generic. All the stuff that you normally need is just there. It's very, very cool. So any questions? Carl, I got a, I got a question. It's somewhat unrelated, but somewhat okay. also related to your Cruft uh, point. Uh, what do you think of the refit package for HTTP client calls? Is that something you use often or recommend? I don't even know what it is. It's refit? Correct. Yeah, it's for um, you essentially create an interface and then add it to dependency oh, injection. reactive. Is uh, it reactive or no? No, it's called refit. Oh, I think oh, that's oh, Okay, I'm looking at it on right. GitHub now. I've used it for a while. I was just curious about your opinion. Um, essentially, you create an interface and you add attributes for your um, certain request parameters and things, and it generates you a concrete class that's going to use the HTTP client to do it for you. That sounds good. I like stuff like that. Cool. Yeah, I, I like it too. I was just curious if you'd use it or not. Yeah, I haven't seen it. The reason I said reactive is because the owner of the repo is okay. reactive UI. Reactive UI refit. The automatic type safe REST library for .NET Core, Xamarin, and .NET. Is that it? That is it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I'll check that out. Cool. Any other questions? Hey, would you mind? Sorry. Uh, I was going to ask Tim if he could uh, share that link in the chat window. Will do. Yes. Yes, I sure. will. Let me stop sharing I now. I got it for you, Carl. Okay. Can you do like auth type of stuff in there too? Uh, right. Yes, I believe so. So it has. Um, no, no, I'm can... talking about in the minimal API. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, what is the question? Okay. Can, we, can you do authentication? authentication oh, sure. Type stuff yeah, in there? Abs absolutely. That stuff I doesn't change. Could. Okay. But where would you put you like the attributes and stuff? All right, so guys, I'm just going through my code here, deleting the bin and object directories. And I'll zip this up and put it somewhere where you guys can access it. Uh, Sam, do you have a, a preference on how I get this to you? Um, you can either email me the link to your GitHub. Um... Yeah, it's or not can, in a repo, although I could make a repo. Okay. Or you could just send me the zip if, uh, if it's small enough. Yeah, I can do that. Let me do that. Uh, as far as um, auth with minimal API, not something I've done, but I know it's possible, and I've seen demos of it. So. Yeah, I I'm looking at uh, the docs now. You just put an attribute as the, uh, in front of the uh, function parameter. Right. I mean, you have the authorized attribute that yeah. doesn't go away. Yeah, it's just in a different spot than you yeah. normally see it. Thank you. You bet. All right. So I'm zipping these up now. And you know what I'll do? I'll I'll make this Cleveland Min API zip. Copy it here, and then I'll actually send it up with uh, to a drive. Google Drive. So while Carl is wrapping that up, does anyone have uh, any uh, additional questions for Carl? Could be about anything.
Isn't that watch. snow piling up by now? Yeah, I know. It's it's almost <laughs> like it never accumulates. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Not a single flake came on, came on your shoulder. I know. It's amazing. All right. So I'm going to get a link to this. Anyone with a link can access it and I'll paste it in. How about that? I just paste it right here. Sounds good. All right. Very good. Thanks for doing that, Carl. And uh, thanks for a great presentation. Um, very insightful and some very cool features. Um, so thanks again. You're welcome. All right, just have some uh, wrap up uh, announcements. Uh, in addition to all the links that have been posted in chat, uh, there are a few more that I just posted as well, and we'll go over those in detail. So you'll have the, the link to the YouTube channel uh, where the meeting presentation will be edited and uploaded. Uh, strongly suggest you subscribe to the channel, that way you get notifications whenever new videos are uploaded. Uh, also, tech events will be posted on my blog, uh, samnasser.blogspot.com. And in addition, uh, the feedback eval is uh, in the chat window as well. And we'll be using that for raffling off the prizes uh, from uh, DevExpress. And also, the special offer from manning.com uh, includes the discount code MTPCLEC21 exclamation that allows you 35% off on a selection of books from Manning, and the URL is listed there as well. I'm putting in all my URLs here, my Great. references. All Blazor trained, can't forget about that. Yep, That's and also <laughs> when you get a chance, thank DevExpress for uh, presenting Blazor Train and the .NET show. Um, you know, without their support, I couldn't be doing this. Absolutely, they've been a great support of all user groups uh, in general. So hats off to them and uh, thank you for your sponsorship. Uh, as far as uh, technical events that are happening, being that it's the end of the year, there aren't very many. Uh, however, wanted to mention that uh, starting in the new year, January 27th, we're gonna resume the normal schedule of having the meetings every Thursday. And Matt Torgerson will be joining us on January 27th to discuss C Sharp 10. So you can visit the meetup site and register an RSVP there. As far as uh, conferences, January 11th through the 14th, that is an in-person conference, codemesh.org, and tickets are still on sale and still available. So you can check those out. Uh, and if you're not interested in an in-person conference, you can also attend one virtually, and that is the Global AI Bootcamp. That's gonna be hosted live from Plano, Texas. So the Global, Global AI Bootcamp essentially allows multiple cities to host the event. Uh, so naturally, since Plano, Texas is the closest one to us, that's the one that uh, we're plugging. So that is a free all-day event of various AI topics, uh, and you can uh, register for free at uh, the link listed there. And again, these uh, meetings will be posted on my blog to make the links accessible. As we always do, we'd like to thank Tech Systems uh, for not only for their sponsorship in the past, but in the future as we resume in-person meetings, but also feel free to check out their website for any IT job openings. In addition, always like to ask, who's hiring? Anyone have any job openings in your place of employment? Going once, twice. <laughs> All right, maybe not. Any, anybody looking for Blazor Consulting? That's kind of my bag these days. Yeah, good stuff though. Uh, Blazor is a very interesting technology. It is, yeah. All right, so to wrap it up, my contact information if needed, you can reach me at my email, snasser at nistechnologies.com. You can also find me on Twitter, and my blog, as mentioned earlier, and I invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn. So if there's no further questions, uh, thank you all for attending and uh, Merry Christmas to those who celebrate Christmas and Happy New Year to everyone. 
and look forward to seeing you all in the new year. And thank you again, Carl. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye.